The Hermit by Tuesday Love Sang Grandpa Read for you by Blue Friend in beautiful B.C. This is September 2017. Chapter 1 Outside, the sun was shining. Vividly, it illumined the trees, threw black shadows behind the jutting rocks, and sent a myriad glinting points from the blue, blue lake. Here, though, in the cool recesses of the old hermit's cave, the light was filtered by overhanging fronds, and came, greenly, soothingly, to tired eyes strained by exposure to the glaring sun. The young man bowed respectfully to the thin hermit, sitting erect on a time-smoothed boulder. "'I have come to you for instruction, venerable one,' he said in a low voice. "'Be seated,' commanded the elder. The young monk, in the brick-red robe, bowed again and sat cross-legged on the hard-packed earth, a few feet from his senior." The old hermit kept silent, seemingly gazing into an infinity of pasts through eyeless sockets. Long, long years before, as a young lama, he had been set upon by Chinese officials in Lhasa, and cruelly blinded for not revealing state secrets which he did not possess. Tortured, maimed, and blinded, he had wandered embittered and disillusioned away from the city. Moving by night, he walked on, almost insane with pain and shock. He avoided human company, thinking, always thinking. Climbing ever upwards, living on the sparse grass or any herbs he could find, led to water for drinking by the tinkle of mountain streams, he kept a tenuous hold on the spark of life. Slowly his worse hurts healed, his eyeless sockets no longer dripped. But ever he climbed upwards, away from mankind, which tortured insanely and without reason. The air became thin. No longer were there tree branches which could be peeled and eaten for food. No longer could he just reach out and pluck grasses. Now he had to crawl on hands and knees, reeling, stretching, hoping to get enough to stave off the worst pangs of hunger. The air became colder, the bite of the wind keener, but still he plodded on, upwards, ever upwards, as if driven by some inner compulsion. Weeks before, at the outset of his journey, he had found a stout branch which he had used as a stave with which to pick his path. Now his questing stick struck solidly against a barrier, and his probing could find no way through it. The young monk looked intently at the old man. No sign of movement. Was he all right? the young man wondered, and then consoled himself with the thought that the ancient venerables lived in the world of the past, and never hurried for anyone. He gazed curiously around the bare cave. Bare indeed it was. At one side, a yellowed pile of straw, his bed. Close to it, a bowl. Over a projecting finger of rock, a tattered saffron robe drooped mournfully, as if conscious of its sun-bleached state, and nothing more, nothing. The ancient man reflected on his past, thought of the pain of being tortured, maimed, and blinded, when he was as young as the young man sitting before him. In a frenzy of frustration, his staff struck out at the strange barrier before him. Vainly, he strove to see through eyeless sockets. At last, exhausted by the intensity of his emotions, he collapsed at the foot of the mysterious barrier. 
The thin air seeped through his solitary garment, slowly robbing the starved body of heat and life. Long moments passed. Then came the clatter of shod feet striking across the rocky ground. Muttered words in an incomprehensible language and the limp body was lifted and carried away. There came a metallic clang, and a waiting vulture, feeling cheated of his meal, soared into clumsy flight. The old man started. All that was long ago. Now he had to give instruction to the young fellow before him, so like he had been. How many years was it? Sixty, seventy, or more. No matter, that was behind, lost in the mists of time. What were the years of a man's life when he knew of the years of the world? Time seemed to stand still. Even the faint wind, which had been rustling through the leaves, ceased its whisper. There was an air of almost eerie expectancy as the young man waited for the old hermit to speak. At last, when the strain was becoming almost unbearable to the younger man, the venerable one spoke. "'You have been sent to me,' he said, "'because you have a great task in life, "'and I have to acquaint you with my own knowledge "'so that you are in some measure made aware of your destiny.' "'He faced in the direction of the young monk "'who squirmed with embarrassment. "'It was difficult, he thought, dealing with blind people.' They look without seeing, but one had the feeling that they saw all, a most difficult state of affairs. The dry, scarce-used voice resumed. When I was young, I had many experiences, painful experiences. I left our great city of Lhasa and wandered blind in the wilderness, starving, Ill and unconscious, I was taken I know not where, and instructed in preparation for this day, when my knowledge has been passed on to you. My life's work is ended, and I can go in peace to the heavenly fields. So saying, a beatific glow suffused the sunken, parchment-like cheeks, and he unconsciously twirled his prayer wheel the faster. Outside, the slow shadows crawled across the ground. The wind grew in strength and twisted bone-dry dust into little swirls. Somewhere a bird called an urgent warning. Almost imperceptibly, the light of day waned as the shadows grew even longer. In the cave, now decidedly dark, the young monk tightly clasped his body in the hope of staving off the rumbles of increasing hunger. Hunger, learning and hunger, he thought, they always go together. Hunger and learning, a fleeting smile crossed the hermit's face. Ah, he exclaimed, so the information is correct. The young man is hungry. The young man rattles like an empty drum. My informant told me it would be so, and provided the cure. Slowly, painfully, and creaking with age, he rose to his feet and tottered to a so far unseen part of the cave. Reappearing, he handed the young monk a small package. From your honorable guide, he explained. He said it would make your studies the sweeter. Sweet cakes, sweet cakes from India, as relief from the eternal barley or sampa, and a little goat's milk as a change from water and more water. No, no, exclaimed the old hermit as he was invited to partake of the food.
I appreciate the needs of the young, and especially of one that will be going out into the wide world beyond the mountains. Eat and enjoy it. I, an unworthy person, try in my humble way to follow the gracious Lord Buddha and live on the metaphorical grain of mustard seed. But you, eat and sleep, for I feel the night is upon us. So saying, he turned and moved into the well-concealed inner portion of the cave. The young man moved to the mouth of the cave, now a grayish oval against the blackness of the interior. The high mountain peaks were hard, black cutouts against the purpling space beyond. Suddenly there was a growing silvery effulgence of light as the full moon was displayed by the passing of a solitary black cloud, displayed as though the hand of a god had drawn back the curtains of night that laboring mankind should see the queen of the sky. But the young monk did not stay long. His repast was meager indeed, and would have been wholly unacceptable to a western youth. Soon he returned to the cave, and, scraping a depression in the soft sand for his hip, fell soundly asleep. The first faint streaks of light found him stirring uneasily. Awakening with a rush, he leapt to his feet and gazed guiltily around. At that moment, the old hermit walked feebly into the main part of the cave. "'O oh, venerable one!' exclaimed the young monk nervously. "'I overslept and did not attend the midnight service.' Then he felt foolish as he realized where he was. "'Have no fear, young man,' smiled the hermit. "'We have no services here. "'Man, when involved, can have his service within himself anywhere at any time, "'without having to be herded and congregate like mindless yaks. "'But make your sampa, have your meal, for today I have much to tell you, "'and you must remember all.' So saying, he wandered slowly out into the lightning day. An hour later, the young man was sitting before the elder, listening to a story that was as enthralling as it was strange. A story that was the foundation of all religions, all fairy tales, and all legends upon the world a story that has been suppressed by power-jealous priests and scientists since the first tribal days. Probing fingers of the sun filtered gently through the foliage at the mouth of the cave and glinted brightly from the metallic ores embedded in the rock. The air warmed slightly and a faint haze appeared on the surface of the lake. A few birds chattered noisily as they set about their never-ending task of finding enough food in the sparse land. High overhead, a solitary vulture soared on a rising current of air, rising and falling with the outspread, motionless wings as his sharp, sharp eyes stretched the barren terrain in search of the dead or dying. Satisfied that there was nothing for him here, he swooped sideways with a cross squawk and set off for more profitable sights. The old hermit sat erect and motionless, his emaciated figure barely covered by the remnants of the golden robe, golden no longer, but sun-bleached to a wretched tan, with yellow bands where the folds had, in part, diminished the fading by the sunlight. The skin was taut across his high, sharp cheekbones, and of that waxen, whitish pallor, so common to the unsighted, his feet were bare, and his possessions were few indeed. A bowl, a prayer wheel, and just a spare robe as tattered as the other. Nothing more. 
nothing more in the whole world. The young monk, sitting before him, pondered the matter. The more a man's spirituality, the less his worldly possessions. The great abbots, with their cloth of gold, their riches and their ample food, they were always fighting for political power and living for the moment while giving lip service to the scriptures. Young man, the old voice broke in, my time is almost at an end. I have to pass on my knowledge to you, and then my spirit will be free to go to the heavenly fields. You are he who will pass on this knowledge to others. So listen, and store the whole within your memory, and fail not. Learn this, study that, thought the young monk. Life is nothing but hard work now. No kites, no stilts, no... But the hermit went on. You know how I was treated by the Chinese. You know how I wandered in the wilderness and came at last to a great wonder. A miracle befell me, for an inner compulsion led me until I fell unconscious at the very portals of the Shrine of Wisdom. I will tell you. My knowledge shall be yours, even as it was shown to me. For sightless, I saw all. The young monk nodded his head, forgetting that the old man could not see him, and then, remembering, he said, I am listening, venerable master, and I have been trained to remember all. So saying, he bowed, and then sat back, waiting. The old man smiled his satisfaction and continued, The first thing I remember was of lying very comfortably on a soft bed. Of course, I was young then, much like you are now, and I thought I had been transported to the heavenly fields. But I could not see, and I knew that if this had been the other side of life, sight would have been mine again. So I laid there, and I waited. Before long, very quiet footsteps approached and stopped by my side. I lay still, not knowing what to expect. Ah, said a voice, which seemed to be in some way different from our voices. Ah, so you have regained consciousness. Do you feel well? What a stupid question, I thought. How could I feel well as I'm starving to death? Starving? But I no longer felt hungry. I did feel well, very well. Cautiously I moved my fingers, felt my arms, and they were not sticks any longer. I had filled out, and was normal again, except that I still had no eyes. Yes, yes, I do feel well, thank you for asking, I replied. The voice said, We would have restored your eyesight, but your eyes were removed, so we could not do so. Rest a while, and we will talk with you in detail. I rested. I had no choice. Soon I dropped off to sleep. How long I slept I have no way of knowing but sweet chimes eventually aroused me. Chimes sweeter and more mellow than the finest gongs, better than the most ancient silver bells, more sonorous than temple trumpets. I sat up and stared round as if I could force sight into my eyeless sockets. A gentle arm slid around my shoulders, and a voice said, Rise, and come with me. I will lead you. The young monk sat fascinated, wondering why things like that did not happen to him, little knowing that they eventually would. Please continue, venerable master, please continue, he cried. The old hermit smiled his gratification at his listener's interest, and went on. 
I was led into what was evidently a large room, and in which there was a number of people. I could hear the murmur of their breath and the rustle of their garments. My guide said, Sit here, and a strange device was pushed under me. Expecting to sit on the ground, as all sensible persons do, I nearly knocked one end through to the other. The old hermit paused for a moment, and a dry chuckle escaped him as he recalled that bygone scene. I felt it carefully, he continued, and it seemed soft, yet firm. It was supported on four legs, and at the rear there was an obstruction which held my back. At first my conclusion was that they deemed me too weak to sit up unaided, and then I detected signs of suppressed amusement. So it appeared that this was the manner of seating for these people. I felt strange and most unsafe sitting up in such a fashion, and I freely confess that I hung on grimly to the padded platform. The young monk tried to imagine sitting on a platform. Why should there be such things? Why did people have to invent useless items? No, he decided, the ground was good enough for him. Safer, no risk of falling, and who was so weak that he had to have his back supported? But the old man was speaking again. His lungs were certainly working well, thought the young man. You wonder about us, the voice said to me. You wonder who we are, why you feel so well. Sit more easily, for we have much to tell you, and much to show you. Most illustrious one, I expostulated, I am blind. My eyes were removed. Yet you say you have much to show me? How can this be? Rest at peace, said the voice, for all will come clear to you with time and patience. The backs of my legs were beginning to ache, dangling in such a strange position. So I drew them up and tried to sit in the lotus position on that little wooden platform supported on four legs and with the strange obstructing thing at the back. So seated, I felt more at ease, although there was certainly the fear that, not seeing, I might topple off to I know not where. We are the gardeners of the earth said the voice. We travel in universes, putting people and animals on many different worlds. You earthlings have your legends about us. You refer to us as the gods of the sky. You talk of our flaming chariots. Now we are to give you information as to the origin of life on earth so that you can pass on the knowledge to one who shall come after, and who shall go into the world and write of these things. For it is time that people knew the truth of their gods before we initiate the second stage. But there is some mistake, I cried in great dismay. I am but a poor monk who climbed to this high place, I know not why. We, by our science, sent for you, murmured the voice. You have been chosen for this because of your exceptional memory, which we shall even strengthen. We know all about you, and that is why you are here. Outside the cave, in the now brilliant light of day, a bird's note rose sharply and shrilly in sudden alarm. A shriek of avian outrage, and the clucking diminished as the bird fled the spot precipitately. The ancient hermit raised his head a moment and said, It is nothing, probably a high-flying bird scored a hit. 
the young monk found it painful to be distracted from this tale of a bygone age, an age which, strangely enough, he found not too difficult to visualize. By the placid waters of the lake the willows nodded in somnolence, disturbed only by vagrant breezes which stirred the leaves and made them mutter in protest at the invasion of their rest. By now the early shafts of sunlight had left the entrance of the cave, and here it was cool with green-tinted light. The old hermit stirred slightly, rearranged his tattered robe, and continued. I was frightened, very frightened. What did I know of the gardeners of the earth? I was not a gardener. I knew nothing of plants or universes either. I wanted no part of it. So thinking, I put my legs over the edge of the platform, seat and rose to my feet. Gentle but very firm hands pushed me back so that I was again sitting in that foolish manner with my legs hanging straight down and my back pressed against something behind me. The plants do not dictate to the gardener, murmured a voice. Here you have been brought and here you will learn. Around me as I sat dazed but resentful, there commenced a considerable discussion in an unknown tongue. Voices, voices, some high and thin, as though coming from the throats of dwarfs, some deep, resonant, sonorous, or like unto the bull of the yak at mating time, bellowing forth across a landscape. Whatever they were, I thought, they boded ill for me, a reluctant subject, an unwilling captive. I listened in some awe as the incomprehensible discussion went on. Thin pipings, deep roaring like a trumpet blast in a canyon. What manner of people were these, I wondered. Could human throats have such a range of tones, overtones and semitones? Where was I? Perhaps I was worse off than even in the hands of the Chinese. Oh, for sight, for eyes to see that which was now denied me. Would the mystery vanish under the light of sight? But no, as I was to find later, the mystery would deepen. So I sat, reluctant and very afraid. The tortures I had undergone in Chinese hands had rather unmanned me, made me feel that I could bear no more, no more at all. Better the nine dragons should come and consume me now that I should have to endure the unknown. So I sat, for there was nothing else to do. Raised voices made me fear for my safety. Had I sight, I would have made a desperate effort to escape. But one without eyes is particularly helpless. One is completely at the mercy of others, at the mercy of everything. The stone that trips the closed door, the unknown looms ever before one, menacing, oppressive, and ever fearsome. The uproar rose to a crescendo. Voices shrilled in the highest registers. Voices roared like the booming of fighting bulls. I feared violence, blows which would come to me through my eternal darkness. Tightly I gripped the edge of my seat, then hastily released my hold, as it occurred to me that a blow could knock me off with little harm if I gave it to it. Yet, if I held on, the impact would be the greater. Fear not, said the now familiar voice. This is just a council meeting. No harm will come to you. We are just discussing how best to indoctrinate you. Exalted one, 
I replied in some confusion. I am surprised indeed to find that such great ones bandy words, even as the lowest yak herders in our hills. An amused chuckle greeted my comment. My audience, it appeared, was not ill-pleased with my, perhaps, foolish forthrightedness. Always remember this, he replied, no matter how high one goes, there is always argument, disagreement. Always one has an opinion which differs from the one held by others. One has to discuss, to argue, and to forcefully uphold one's own opinion, or one becomes a mere slave, an automaton, ever ready to accept the dictates of another. Free discussion is always regarded by the non-comprehending onlooker as the prelude to physical violence. He patted my shoulder reassuringly and continued. Here we have people from not merely many races, but many worlds. Some are from your own solar system. Some are from galaxies far beyond. Some, to you, would appear as thin dwarfs, while others are truly giants of more than six times the stature of the smallest. I heard his footsteps receding as he moved to join the main group. Other galaxies? What was all this? What were other galaxies? Giants, well, most people I had heard of them in fairy tales. Dwarfs, now, some of those had appeared in sideshows from time to time. I shook my head. It was all beyond me. He had said that I wouldn't be harmed, that it was merely a discussion, but not even the Indian traders who came to the city of Lhasa made such hootings and trumpetings and roarings. I decided to sit still and await developments. After all, there was nothing else I could do. In the cool dimness of the hermit's cave, the young monk sat absorbed, enthralled by this tale of strange beings, but not so enthralled that internal rumblings had gone unnoticed. Food, urgent food, that was important matter now. The old hermit suddenly ceased to speak and murmured, Yes, we must have a break. Prepare your meal. I will return. So saying, he rose to his feet and slowly moved to his inner recess. The young monk hurried out into the open. For a moment he stood staring out across the landscape, then made his way to the lakeside, where the fine sand, as brown as earth, gleamed invitingly. From the front of his robe he took his wooden bowl and dipped it in the water. A swirl and a fleck and it was washed. Taking a little bag of ground barley from his robe, he poured a meager amount into the bowl and judiciously poured in lake water from his cupped hand. Gloomily he contemplated the mess. No butter here, no tea either ground barley mixed into a stiff paste with water. Food. Into the bowl he dipped his fingers and stirred and stirred until the consistency was just right. Then with two fingers from his right hand he spooned out the mess and slowly and unenthusiastically ate it. Finished at last he rinsed the bowl in the lake water and then took a handful of fine sand. Energetically he scoured the bowl inside and out before rinsing it again and returning it, still wet, to the front of his robe. Kneeling on the ground he spread the lower half of his robe and scooped sand onto it until he could lift no more. Lurching to his feet he staggered back to the cave. Just inside he dumped the sand and returned to the open for a fallen branch with many small twigs. 
In the cave, he carefully swept the hard-packed sandy earth floor before sprinkling over a thick layer of fresh sand. One load was not sufficient. Seven loads it took before he was satisfied and could sit with a clear conscience on his rolled and tattered yak wool blanket. He was no fashion plate for any country. His red robe was his solitary garment, threadbare and thin in places almost to transparency. It was no protection against the bitter winds. No sandals, no underwear, nothing but the solitary robe which was doffed at night when he rolled himself in his blanket. Of equipment he had but the bowl, the minute barley bag, and an old and battered charm box, long since discarded by another, in which he kept a simple talisman. He did not own a prayer wheel. That was for the more affluent. He and others like him had to make do with the public ones in the temples. His skull was shaven and scarred by the marks of manhood, burn marks where he had endured the candles of incense burning down on his head to test his devotion, meditation, wherein he should have been immune to pain and to the smell of burning flesh. Now, having been chosen for a special task, he had travelled far to the cave of the hermit. But the day was wearing on with the lengthening shadows and the fast chilling of the air. He sat and waited for the appearance of the old hermit. At last there came the shuffling footsteps, the tapping of the long staff, and the stertorous breathing of that ancient man. The young monk gazed at him with new respect. What experiences he had had! what suffering he had endured, how wise he seemed. The old man shuffled round and sat down. On the instant a blood-freezing shout rent the air and an immense and shaggy creature bounded into the cave entrance. The young monk leaped to his feet and prepared to meet his death in trying to protect the old hermit. Grabbing two handfuls of the sandy soil, he was about to throw it in the eyes of the intruder when he was stopped and reassured by the voice of the newcomer. Greetings, greetings, holy hermit, he bellowed as if he shouted to someone a mile away. Your blessing, I ask, your blessing on the journey, your blessing for the night as we camp by the lakeside. Here, he bawled, I've brought you tea and barley. Your blessing, holy hermit, your blessing. Jumping into action again, much to the renewed alarm of the young monk, he rushed before the hermit and sprawled in the freshly strewn sand before him. Tea, barley, here, take them. Thrusting out, he placed two bags beside the hermit. Traitor, traitor expostulated the hermit mildly. You alarm an old and ailing man with your violence. Peace be with you. May the blessings of Gotama be upon you and dwell within you. May your journey be safe and swift, and may your business prosper. And who are you, young gamecock? boomed the traitor. Ah, he exclaimed suddenly, my apologies, young holy father. In the gloom of this cave I did not see at first that you are one of the cloth. And what news have you, traitor? asked the hermit in his dry and cracked voice. What news? mused the traitor. The Indian moneylender was beaten up and robbed, and when he went crying to the proctors, he got beaten up again for calling them foul names. The price of yaks has dropped. The price of butter has gone up. The priests at the gate are increasing their toll. The inmost one has journeyed to the jeweled palace. 
Oh, holy hermit, there is no news. Tonight we camp by the lake, and tomorrow we continue on our journey to Kalimpong. The weather is good. Buddha has looked after us, and the devils have left us alone. And do you need water carried, or a supply of fresh dry sand for your floor, or is this young holy father looking after you well? The shadows traveled far on their journey towards the blackness of night. The hermit and the trader talked and exchanged news of Lhasa, of Tibet and of India, far beyond the Himalayas. At last the trader jumped to his feet and peered fearfully at the growing darkness. Oh, young holy father, I cannot go alone in the darkness. Devils will get me. Will you lead me back to my camp? he implored. I am under the instruction of the venerable hermit, replied the young man. I will go if he will permit. My priestly robe will protect me from the perils of the night. The old hermit chuckled as he gave the permission. The thin young monk led the way out of the cave. The towering giant of a traitor followed, reeking of yak wool and worse. Just by the entrance he chanced to brush against a leafy branch. There was a squawk as a frightened bird was dislodged from its perch. The traitor uttered a terrified screech and fell fainting at the feet of the young monk. Oh, young holy father, I thought the devils had got me at last. I almost, but not quite, decided to give the money back I took from the Indian money lenders. You saved me. You beat off the devils. Get me safe to my camp, and I'll give you a half brick of tea and a whole bag of sampa. This was an offer too good to miss, so the young monk put on a special show by reciting the prayers of the dead, the exhortation to unrestful spirits, and a chant to the guardians of the way. The resulting uproar, for the young monk was very unmusical, scared away all the creatures who roamed by night, whatever it did to any chance devils. At last they reached the campfire, where others of the trader's party were singing and playing musical instruments, while the women were grinding up tea bricks and dropping the results into a bubbling cauldron of water. A whole bag of finely ground barley was stirred in, and then one old woman reached a claw-like hand into a bag and withdrew it, holding a fistful of yak butter. Into the cauldron it went, another and yet another, until the fat oozed and frothed on the surface. The glow of the firelight was inviting, the pleasure of the trading party infectious. The young monk folded his robe around him and sedately sat on the ground. An aged crone, with chin almost touching nose, hospitably held out her hand. The young monk self-consciously proffered his bowl, and a generous helping of tea and sampa was ladled in. In the thin mountain air, boiling was not a hundred degrees centigrade, nor two hundred and twelve Fahrenheit, but bearable to the mouth. The whole party set to with gusto, and soon there was a procession to the lake waters, so that the bowl could be washed and scoured afresh in the fine river sand. The river feeding the lake brought the finest sand from higher in the mountain range, sand which frequently was flecked with gold. 
The party was merry, the stories of the traders many, and their music and songs brought color to the young man's rather dull existence. But the moon climbed higher, lighting the barren landscape with her silvery glow and casting shadows with stark reality. The sparks from the fire no longer rose in the clouds. The flames died low. Reluctantly, the young monk rose to his feet, and with many bows of thanks, accepted the gifts thrust upon him by the trader, who was sure the young man had saved him from perdition. At last, laden with little packages, he stumbled along by the lake, to the right, through the small grove of willows, and on to where the mouth of the cave glowered black and forbidding. He stopped beside the entrance for a moment, and looked up at the sky, far, far above, as if approaching the door of the gods, a bright flame sailed silently across the sky. A chariot of the gods? Or what? The young monk wondered briefly and entered the cave. End of chapter 1